Neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, that's a tongue twister, is basically the collection of symptoms that a baby has after they are born to a mother who took opioids during pregnancy. So that could have been a substance abuse issue or she could have been managing pain during pregnancy. So after the baby is born and is no longer exposed to those opioids, the baby may or may not have withdrawal symptoms from those opioids. Really, NOWS, or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, refers to when mother was actually on a member of the opioid family. So it could be fentanyl or heroin or methadone or a painkiller like oxycodone or codeine. So very specifically from the opioid family. I'm sure you've all taken care of these babies and you've seen how tough the first few days and the first few weeks of their lives can be. And honestly, if you're a bedside nurse, then that can be really tough on the entire medical team as well. The other term that we frequently use in this sort of scenario is neonatal abstinence syndrome. And for a long time, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome and neonatal abstinence syndrome have been used interchangeably. But there is a difference. Neonatal abstinence syndrome refers to the symptoms that the baby has if they're withdrawing from any drug, not just an opioid. So for example, they could be withdrawing from a benzodiazepine like Xanax, or they could be withdrawing from a, a phenobarbital or from nicotine or from alcohol. So those aren't really nows because those aren't opioids. They're part of the neonatal abstinence syndrome. The term neonatal abstinence syndrome is also not great for neonates anyway because the term abstinence implies that the person is purposely abstaining or purposely avoiding that drug whereas obviously neonates don't have the capacity to make that choice they are not purposely abstaining from the drug that they'd previously been exposed to. And also realize that depending on what the baby was actually exposed to during pregnancy, then that is going to determine medical treatment if the baby ends up needing medical management. So for example, if the mummy was on oxycodone throughout the whole pregnancy and the baby has really bad withdrawal symptoms, then we are going to treat that with an opioid like morphine. But if the baby was exposed to benzodiazepines or alcohol throughout the whole pregnancy, like they could be in neonatal abstinence syndrome, and the baby now has withdrawal symptoms, then we would treat that with a benzodiazepine, not with a morphine or with another opioid. Hello, I'm Dr. Tala, and I've been a neonatologist for 17 years now. Members of our lovely community asked us to cover this topic. So if you want that sort of power and lots of other little tidbits of neonatal education, then please think about joining our membership. Right, let's get back to the topic on hand. So today we're going to cover three things. One, what is neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome? I'm gonna use nows from now on because it's too much of a tongue twister. Two, how do we test for nows? And three, how do we evaluate an infant with NAUS? In the next video, we will cover management, pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment. So wait for that for when that comes out. One, what is NAUS? Well, we pretty much already covered this. It is the set of symptoms that a baby has if they're withdrawing from the mother having been on an opioid during pregnancy. These withdrawal symptoms can cause a lot of discomfort. So just a lot of irritability and crying and no sleep and poor feeding. But beyond that, they can also become quite dangerous. So if a baby is not eating well and is having really loose stools, babies can get dehydrated and have failure to thrive from these withdrawal symptoms. On the horrible end of these withdrawal symptoms, babies can actually have seizures from withdrawal. This is actually extremely rare. We talk about it a lot, but it really is extremely rare. And it really isn't, NOWS really isn't an actual lethal disease. They will be very irritable and really go through some horrible symptoms. But like I said, seizures are very rare and babies are very unlikely to actually die from it. But what we do worry about a lot more is how will these horrible symptoms that this baby is experiencing affect their future development? Unfortunately, there aren't great studies on this just because it's so difficult to tease out what is really affecting the baby in the future. 
But it would be very logical to assume that a baby that has a horrible first month of life, crying and irritable and just completely unconsolable, that is in some way going to affect their future developmental outcomes. Another thing to remember is that the mother could literally be exposed to any type of opioids. And there's a very, very long list of opioids. Take a look at it. Some of them are recreational drugs and a lot of them are actually prescribed pain medications, whether the mother is getting them legally or illegally. Unfortunately, there has been a massive increase in NOWS over the last two decades. If you haven't been living under a rock, then you will know that the US, as well as a lot of the rest of the world, has been going through an opioid crisis, especially in kind of the last 15 years. For example, in 2015, three times the amount of prescriptions were filled for opioid pain relievers as compared to 1999. So that by 2015, about 37% of US adults were being given a prescription and filling it for an opioid pain reliever. How crazy is that statistic? More than a third of US adults were being given an opioid pain reliever. It's mind blowing. I won't go into the politics of the opioid crisis, but just realize all opiates are unbelievably addictive medications. And it worked out for some very large drug companies to get very many people addicted, which wasn't difficult to get them addicted. Obviously, as opioid use and opioid use disorders increase, they're also going to increase in pregnant women. And so the more pregnant women that are taking opioids, the increase that there's going to be in NOWS. The use of any opioid in pregnancy can greatly increase the risk of an opioid use disorder. And realize that in the mothers, an opioid use disorder can be extremely dangerous and lead to major impairment and even death. I'm not going to spend a long time discussing all the various medications mommy may or may not be on during pregnancy. Just realize that if a mother does have opioid use disorder, then there's a higher chance that she's also using other substances, whether it's other medications like benzodiazepines or alcohol or other recreational drugs as well. So just be aware of that. In the US, NOWS is especially concentrated in rural and tribal areas. And even within a city, there are different hospitals that have patients with more NOWS. And I'm sure you've all realized that. You've gone and worked in a different hospital and been like, where did all these patients come from? Even though it probably wasn't that far from your first hospital. Two. Now let's talk about testing babies for nows. Obviously, like everything in medicine, I've been a broken record with this, everything should start with a good history. So hopefully the obstetricians will already have had that history. What medications or drugs has the mother been on? What sort of doses has she been taking? How long has she been on the medications for? Has the mother had any positive drug screens during this pregnancy or even before the pregnancy? Has the mother ever tested positive for a sexually transmitted infection? We know that infections like hepatitis C, HIV, and syphilis highly correlate with maternal drug use. In the past, there has been talk of doing universal drug screens on all mothers. But has, as has been found, this can have legal ramifications and unequal consequences of babies of different races and ethnicities. So really, this should be shut down. So really, each obstetrician and indeed each hospital will get drug screens on mothers for different reasons. Some common reasons to routinely obtain a urine drug screen or some sort of drug screen would be if the mother was on any prescription opioids, if she had any previous history of a positive drug screen, or if the mother had an abruption. With an abruption, we worry a lot more whether the mother was on any drugs like cocaine. Obstetricians also have questionnaires for substance abuse screening in pregnancy. And there are lots of tools that various doctors have used. One of them is the four Ps. So the patient has to answer whether their parents ever had any issues with alcohol or drugs, whether their partner has issues with alcohol or drugs, whether they've personally in the past had any issues with alcohol or drugs. And the fourth P is, have they used alcohol or drugs within the past month? 
And according to this questionnaire, any yes is deserving of a larger workup. Whether they actually do a drug screen or not is going to be determined by that individual clinician. We often have to test the infants too to see whether they were exposed to any appreciable amount of drugs. So generally, we could test the baby's urine or the baby's meconium or the baby's umbilical cord. Previously, it was thought that testing the baby's umbilical cord was similar to testing the baby's meconium, but a study showed that it really wasn't that consistent. Also, it takes a really long time for umbilical cord drug testing to come back, and not every lab does it. Because many drugs are rapidly metabolized and excreted, you need to make sure that you get that urine sample as soon after birth as possible. So bag that baby if you need a urine drug screen. Also realize that a positive urine drug screen is basically going to represent a recent exposure of the mother. It's not necessarily going to represent something that the mother took a month ago. Meconium drug testing is really considered the gold standard for testing whether the baby was exposed to drugs or not. And the window that we would be testing for when the mother took drugs is a lot longer. Meconium drug screening can be positive if the mother took a drug as early as 20 weeks of her pregnancy. But as everybody knows, collecting meconium is really not that easy. And you basically need all of it before the transitional stool comes in. That's also a problem if the mother had meconium-stained amniotic fluid and the baby's already pooed out a bunch of meconium. It can also take some time to come back and it won't tell you about whether the mother recently stopped taking the drugs altogether. So the ideal situation is to have the meconium as well as the urine drug screen so that you can have an idea of how long the mother's been doing it and whether the mother did recently stop or not. Another crucial thing for you to realize is that nows only occurs after a chronic exposure to an opioid. So if the mother got like a dose of fentanyl or another a, a opioid in her epidural right before delivery, that is not going to cause withdrawal symptoms in the baby. The baby might test positive in their urine, but obviously you need to go back and check the medications that mommy was given right before delivery. Most of the time, if the baby received that drug, if the mommy received that drug right before delivery, then the baby's meconium is going to be negative. Three, evaluation of an infant with NALS. After we've obtained the history, obviously we have to be evaluating the baby to make sure that the baby isn't actually having any withdrawal symptoms. Just a quick aside here, sometimes we won't have the positive history that the mother was exposed to opiates. But if the baby looks like they are having withdrawal symptoms, then just have a very low threshold to think about nows, especially since it's so common. The signs of withdrawal in the baby will depend on which medication the mother was taking. So basically, if the mother was taking a medication with a long half-life, like methadone, then that medication will stay in the baby for longer and the withdrawal symptoms won't start until later, kind of like two, three days of life. Sometimes with methadone, the withdrawal symptoms in the baby doesn't start until five to seven days of life. But heroin is a much shorter acting drug. So if the baby was exposed to heroin chronically through the pregnancy, the withdrawal symptoms are probably going to start within 12 to 24 hours. So logically, a baby should be observed before they go home from the hospital for a length of time that depends on which medication that the mother was on. So for like immediate release opioids, a baby should be watched for about three days. If it's buprenorphine or Subutex, a baby should be watched for like four to six days. And if it's a long acting opioid like methadone, the baby should probably be watched for five to seven days. Obviously, there's a lot of wiggle room here. If the mother was on methadone all the way during pregnancy and the baby is five days old and already regained birth weight and looks absolutely fantastic, then it's extremely unlikely that the baby's going to start having horrible withdrawal symptoms at day six. Whereas if the baby's already getting a little bit more jitty, jittery and eating worse and the stools are getting looser, then yes, you should, probably should be following that baby for another couple of days. 
Also realize if the mother was on any other medications or substances like nicotine or gabapentin or benzodiazepines or any other drugs, then the withdrawal symptoms might start at random amounts of time, not just dependent solely on the opioid that the mother was on. Also, generally, the more substances the mother was on, the worse the symptoms are in the baby. So what are the symptoms that babies actually experience from NAUs? Well, most of the opioid receptors in a baby's body are in the central nervous system and in the gut. So obviously the clinical symptoms are going to reflect where the receptors are. You will all learn really well how to recognize these symptoms because the severity and the number of these symptoms will really determine how we end up managing these babies. Broadly, we can group these symptoms into three categories. And the first one is central nervous system or CNS irritability. And this is the one that is so heartbreaking to watch and very, very difficult to actually take care of. So these are the symptoms like the continuous high-pitched cry, the excess irritability, a lot of crying and lack of sleep. The babies can become very hypertonic, so just kind of very stiff and have a lot of or hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. If it gets really bad, like we said, these babies can end up having seizures. They are just very unhappy, miserable babies. The second broad category is GI issues or gastrointestinal issues. And really these babies can have like really, really poor feeds and they just aren't interested in eating. They can have a lot of spitting up and vomiting and they can have really, really loose stools. So you can imagine that the combination of all of these plus the increased metabolic rate from all their crying and restlessness can really affect their weight gain. And a lot of these babies can get dehydrated and have weight loss and failure to thrive. And the third large ca category is autonomic instability. So these babies can have a lot of sweating and increased temperatures and actually have a fever. It's one of the important things to consider in the NICU when a baby has a fever, are they actually withdrawing? They can have a lot of yawning several times in a row and a lot of sneezing. All babies can yawn and sneeze, but it's exactly how many times they're doing it in a row and how frequently that they're doing it. Babies can also have some like nasal stuffiness and some increased respiratory rate as well. So just a lot of uh, symptoms of discomfort in the babies. For all these symptoms, there is going to be a spectrum of just how bad they are. So maybe bi babies cry nonstop or they are crying like high pitched for like 15 minutes, but eventually they are consolable. Maybe babies really are unable to sleep or they're sleeping in like 15 minute increments. Maybe the stool is a little bit loose or it could be just flat out watery. And basically the presence or absence of symptoms, as well as just how bad those symptoms are, is what allows us to score the babies to determine just how bad their withdrawal is and what sort of management that they need. And we'll be talking about that a lot more in the next video that's coming up. So just realize that how bad these symptoms are and whether they have them or not is what's really important in the withdrawal. Before we end, I just want to emphasize just how general and non-specific all these symptoms are. So yes, if you have the history of withdrawal, it's easy to put it into that category. But if you don't know that the baby could be withdrawing, you could be thinking the baby's septic or has respiratory issues or has a neuro issue, something going on in the CNS system. So always be thinking about withdrawal and have a very low threshold to test for it. Okay, if you reach this far, then please like this video and now go and watch the next video on treatment of NOWS. Again, thanks so much for being here.